morning. Wasn't that great music to come into? Get you going. I appreciate that so much. I do have a couple announcements that we want to take uh, note of this morning, and we've got some that are that we need to emphasize more than others. Uh, but continue the Annie Armstrong mission offering. Uh, we're at 1640, and we want to try to get to 2,000. So uh, please think about giving to that offering. Also, Administrative Council uh, will be this Tuesday at uh, April 16th at 7. And then one other one I have is that the Nelson County Spring Baptist meeting is this is today. And at 4 o'clock, uh, it starts with some breakout sessions. But if you don't want to come to that, at 545, they have um, just the, the re annual meeting. I mean, that's when the, it starts and the preaching and things like that. But uh, if you'd like to come to be part of that, you're more than welcome to come uh, to be part of the Nelson County Baptist Association. It's at Cedar Creek is where that's at. So uh, Cedar Creek Baptist. So if you want to come be part of that, that would be awesome. But we do have a couple announcements I want to make. Uh, first is that if you're a guest today, we welcome you. We're glad that you're here. I'm glad that you uh, have come together. In your bulletin is a communication card. We'd love for you to fill that out and just give us a little bit of information about you. Any kind of prayer requests, ministry needs that you have, uh, please uh, write that on that card. And that goes for the whole church as well. If you have a ministry need or need to have a prayer concern, please put those down for us. Uh, but that's in the bulletin, uh, and you can put that in the offering plate as it comes around a little bit later. Uh, but two big announcements that we want to do. Uh, Bonnie, I'm going to let you go first, and then Carolyn, you follow Bonnie. Good morning. Our next WMU churchwide pro, uh, project, we're making these little pillows and they're going to go to uh, Sunrise Center in Mount Washington. The last few years we've made the, the knot blankets, but this year we decided we tried the pillows. And these children, it, years ago it was an, an orphanage, but now it's more than that. Troubled children, children who have left home because of abuse, come to Sunrise, and many times they come with just the clothes on their back. So we thought this would be something comforting for them, something they could have the first night that they get there. And it says, and then the next morning, it says, rise and shine and give God the glory. So we have 36 of these that we're going to make. We're tentatively talking about uh, April the 27th, which is on a Saturday, and it will be in the morning, and we'll have coffee and some pastries. And Miss uh, Shirley has been generous enough to sew all the edges for us and all we have to do is tie the knot and close up a little hole. So 27th at 10 o'clock bring white thread and a needle and a pair of scissors and be ready to make these blankets. They're going to be 36 and then we'll deliver them to um, Sunrise in Mount Washington. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. You okay? Can't do one without the other. I was going to protest if he didn't offer his arm. I was. <laughs> Good morning. Next Sunday, we have another opportunity for you, the 21st. Oneida Youth Choir will be with us, leading us in worship. They have requested an old-fashioned potluck. Now, ladies and gentlemen, get your recipes out. You know what those are. Recipes, dust them off. Okay, get your favorite one out and think about what dish that you can bring to, let's show them some good can, Central Kentucky bluegrass hospitality, okay? Now, there are sign-up sheets in the back in the fireside room. Put your name, put what you're going to bring so we won't have all green beans, okay? We need a variety. And then put the number of people from your family that will be eating with us so we can have a head count on that. So it's going to be a good day, and I look forward to that, and I hope you can come and enjoy us. Tom, you want to come lead us in music this morning? Thank you. 
Good morning, church. I got drafted to do some music, and so if you give me a microphone, I'm going to talk. Do we have any April birthdays? Any April birthdays? Today is Matt Jones's birthday. So, honey, I'll sing to you now, and I will refrain from telling the people at the Mexican restaurant to bring the hat. All right. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. birthday to all the April babies. Okay, please join me. Hymn number 489, Heavenly Sunlight. I was planning these hymns in the car pickup line, and it was windy and rainy and so cold, and I said, we need some heavenly sunlight. So please sing it like you mean it. Stand. Sing with me. <laughs> I'll be seated for a moment. We're going to take some time to pray this morning, and we want to have, have some concerns. We just want to pray for those who are having tests, going to have tests this week, and I know uh, Linda West is going to have a test done this week, have a procedure done, so we're going to pray for her. Uh, pray for others that are recovering from surgeries. You saw Bill hop out of here. He's really hurting this morning. Uh, and then also, uh, Linda King is not back with us yet with her surgery, her, her knee. Uh, continue to pray for them. And then others that's undergoing other, other treatments, other illnesses. We've got some that are, are just, just need our, our prayers. We pray for, continue to pray for Danny. It's good to see him here this morning. But please pray for him and lift him up and Jesse Ann as well as uh, she watches over him. And we just want to pray um, for healing in the bodies of those that we love so dearly. Also, um, just remember Jerusalem this morning, Israel, uh, with the attack yesterday, and the Bible tells us to, to pray for peace in Jerusalem. I mean, that's what we're supposed to do, uh, and so we want to pray uh, for peace in that area of the world and pray that that all just stops and, and people can kind of just 
uh, see if they can get along a little bit better than they do. And um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of frightening when you think about it, but just pray about uh, that situation over there and our, our response and uh, their response. And uh, so we really want to just be obedient to the word of the Lord and, and pray for peace of Jerusalem. Um, and so we, we've got a lot to pray for, you know, pray for our country. There's a lot of lost people in this world need Jesus. I need the Lord more than anything else. And so uh, we want to we wanna lift those up as well. So let's pray together. Father, we come before you today, and we just thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you for your love, your mercy, um, your guidance, your grace, Lord, upon us, Lord. And we pray for these that we know are going to have tests, that we know that have uh, surgeries uh, facing them, those that are recovered from surgery or recovering from surgery, uh, uh, those that are still taking treatments uh, and uh, just with all the, the things that are going on in their lives, Lord, we pray, Father, for healing. We pray, God, that you would just give peace to their minds and their hearts and their souls this morning, Lord. We pray that, Father, that you would give them rest uh, from worry. That, God, that uh, I know that as they think about uh, the day, that, God, that, uh, that, Father, that Satan will try to put doubt in their minds. So, Father, I pray that you just uh, surround them with your presence of the Holy Spirit and guard their hearts and minds and the families as well. Let them know that, God, you have them in the palm of your hands and, that, God, that you will be there and you've never forsake them, but you're always with them. We pray, Father, for Jerusalem today, Israel, Lord. We pray for peace over there, Lord. We pray that, that God, this uh, will not escalate into a major war, Lord. We pray that, God, that through your divine hand that God you would uh, just uh, calm the uh, minds of those in charge of different countries over there leaders over there Lord that you would just bring that to a peaceful resolution and, and by your will and by your hand Lord I pray that that the people over there would see the real God and who you are Lord that, that Father they'd understand and recognize uh, Father uh, their importance to you Father I pray Father that You'd be with our country and our county and our city, Father. There's so many people today that are lost and without hope. And they need a risen Savior. They need what we talked about um, on Easter Sunday, that resurrected Jesus, the one that overcomes the grave, conquers sin, Lord. And Father, last week from understanding that we're, our job is to go and tell. So Father, I pray that this week um, we will take that, that message of, of Jesus and that we'll be fishers of men that Father will tell people about your love, your grace and your mercies. We love you so much and we thank you for all that you do for us. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, all of our pulpit pals I think Miss Denise is here. I, you guys just go on with Miss Denise today if you don't mind. Any other, any other pulpit pals? Any other kids coming? He's excited to go to Pulpit Pal. That's fun. Still to the church. Okay, stand with me. We're going to sing hymn number 511, The Solid Rock.
what a pleasure to be in God's house this beautiful Sunday. Lord, uh, just uh, bow with us as we pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this glorious day. We just praise you for all that you have done for us, all those that you have put in our past and our family, Lord. And this is the time in the service where we have an opportunity to give back a portion of what you had provided. Lord, we just ask that people give with an open and loving heart. And Lord, we know that you will take this money and magnify it so that those in this community and even beyond can be reached that need to know about Jesus and salvation. Lord, we just ask all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Today, if you will, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, the fifth chapter, and we're going to look at verses 10 through 12. We're back on finishing up the Beatitudes, the the Sermon on the Mount. We'll continue to work through that a little bit, Um, but I want us to understand all these Beatitudes today, and today is kind of a tough one because it talks about being persecuted, and we live in a world that doesn't like to be persecuted. We like things that are being comfortable, you know? And uh, we don't we don't want to be challenged anyway. And um, but the Bible tells us that when we stand for righteousness, we stand in the name of Christ. That we will be persecuted just like the prophets of old. And so, um, in verse ten in chapter five, it says this: 
Blessed are those who are persecuted. Remember, flourishing. Remember we use the word flourishing. So how we flourish in this life. Uh, flourishing are those. Blessed are those. Happy are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. Father, we pray today that we can learn um, from your word. Uh, that, God, we can rejoice and be glad even though our lives are filled with persecution. God, I pray that you would just be with us and watch over us and, and guide us and through this message today so that our hearts and minds may be opened uh, to what you would teach us and show us uh, through your word and through these beatitudes, through this sermon that you preach to your disciples. We thank you so much, God, for this day. We thank you for the blessing of worship. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So today, we want us to understand that persecution will happen. Persecution will come about. Persecution uh, is mentioned three times in this text. Blessed are those who are persecuted and uh, when they insult you and persecute you. And on down it says, for this is how they persecuted the prophets. So we need to understand that persecution will come when we stand for God. When we make a stand for Jesus, when we make a stand for righteousness, when we make a stand in the name of the Lord, then the things that we need to understand is that we will be persecuted uh, by this world. Uh, we, we tend to forget that this world is not our friend, that this world uh, in which we live and the values in which the world heaps up on us as individuals are not the things of God. They're the things of man. They're the things of, of the devil himself. And so we, we need to understand that when we make a true stand uh, for God, then persecution can come about. And this is what Jesus is teaching them because he's going to say through these first few uh, Beatitudes, you know, that he went through that uh, the last one is uh, you live these things out, guess what's going to happen? Persecution is going to come. And our, our Kent Hughes's commentary, um, I want to share some things with you. I got several notes from different commentaries today because um, for one thing, I forgot my sermon at home. But fortunately, I remembered all my points, so I'm going to borrow some, some stuff, okay? Uh, so, talking uh, about persecution on your own self, you know, I brought it on me. Uh, but uh, R.K. Hughes says this, and when he talks about the, the, the Beatitudes, and, and remember, it, it started back here in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the more, and those right there. You live these Beatitudes, persecution's going to come. Persecution is going to, to show up. And this is what he says, why? He says, first, pro poverty of spirit runs counter to the pride of the unbelieving heart. Those whom the world admires are the self-sufficient who need anything else, not the poor in spirit. And that's true. Uh, second, the mourning rep uh, repentant heart that sorrows over its own sin and the sins of society is not appreciated by the world. Third, the gentle and meek person, the one who has strength not to take up personal offense, is regarded as weak by those who do not know Christ. Conventional wisdom has it uh, that weak meekness is weakness. Hungering, the fourth one, uh, for, and thirsting for spiritual uh, righteousness, that of Christ, is foreign and repugnant to a world that lusts after only what it can touch and taste. Fifth, the only true, the truly merciful person who not only feels compassion and forgiveness, but who gives it out of step with, a, with a, the grudging, bearing callousness of our age. This person is an awkward, embarrassing rebuke of the uncaring. The sixth one, the single-minded, the pure uh, in heart, focused on God, provides a convicting contrast to the impure and self-focused culture. And then seventh, the peacemaker is the discomforting because it will not settle for a cheap or counterfeit peace and has an embarrassing inclination to the wage of peace. Go back and remember what John wrote in John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. 
If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of this world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Paul wrote to Timothy, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Paul also wrote to the Thessalonians, For you yourselves know that we're destined for this. For when we are with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we are to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. So therefore, we need to understand and see that through persecution or through living a godly life, persecution will come. And we live in a world that so does not want to be persecuted. hates even thinking about being persecuted. You know, we think about persecution in third world countries and places uh, where Christians try to live their life. But here in America, here in our own country, if you make a stand, a solid stand on, we sang that song, on Christ the solid rock I stand. We stand on the solid rock of Christ. Guess what's going to happen? Persecution. How does these persecution come? So not only do we flourish through persecution because of righteousness, we flourish uh, through persecution by following Jesus. By following Jesus. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness in verse 10. And then it says in verse 11, uh, they, you are blessed when they insult you per- and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. So here Jesus is telling us that we're persecuted because of him. We're persecuted because we live out these virtues, these values that we read in in the Beatitudes, flourishing through them will bring persecution through the righteousness that that he exposes to the world. But now we see that Jesus says, you're going to be persecuted because of me. Standing with Christ brings persecution. And it brings persecution three ways here. We see three different ways that the world would bring persecution to you and I. The first one is, is that of physical persecution. That's what that really, that's what that means there uh, after he says when they insult you and persecute you. And persecute you is a physical persecution that comes to us. It is that if persecution means chasing, driving away, pursuing, um, uh, from that meaning develop the condemnations of physical persecution, harassment, abuse, and unjust treatment. So that's what that word of uh, persecution persecution means it brings about the physical persecution uh, pers- physical persecutions the harassment abuse that we can uh, have and and heaped upon us unjust treatment because we stand for Christ and we need to see that when we stand for the sake of righteousness we stand for the sake of the Lord we will have the attitude of self-sacrifice for the sake of Christ that our lives don't matter Christ Being exalted is the only thing that matters. Christ and Christ alone. Him being lifted up above everything else in our lives, everything else that we are, everything else that we ambition in life doesn't matter, doesn't surpass that of Christ. Paul knew this. Paul wrote his uh, biography there in Philippians. He talks to us about he was sent with Gamaliel. He was born a free uh, Jew in the Roman world. He was uh, part of the tribe of Benjamin. I mean, just on and on the accolades that he could come. But he said, nothing compares. Nothing surpasses that of knowing Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, this is paraphrasing. Everything else is done. It's worthless. Christ is my everything. And when we have that, there could be physical attacks, abuse heaped up on us. And friends, I don't think we're too far from the world when you're seeing people locked up for preaching and praying on street corners uh, in the modern democratic type of countries. You go to Canada, you go to England, people are being arrested just for bowing their heads and praying, for standing for the Lord. Physical persecution is a doorstep, is a, just a knock on the doorstep for somebody coming in and tell us to stop this service because we are proclaiming Christ above everything else, condemning sin, lifting up Jesus. And we need to see this, that this is happening. 
we live these virtues out in the world, it's going to bring and possibly bring this physical persecution. But also we see here that it says they want to insult you. And I believe that probably if we've made a stand in our job sites, at our work, or out in the world at all, that we probably face some sort of verbal insults already by standing for Jesus Christ. You know, being called names, holy roller, you know, those kind of things, just to kind of throw off things, you know, self-righteous, whatever. But we know that the, 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 the uh, verbal insults are, will be heaped up on us when we stand with Christ. So to be an obedient citizen of the kingdom of God is to court verbal abuse, to bring on verbal abuse and all the reviling that comes with it, that people are not going to be happy. Jesus, as he stood before the Sanhedrin, after he was rest in the garden of Gethsemane, he was spat upon, he was beaten, he was taunted with words. Matthew 26 says, prophesy to us, you Christ. At least I got that right. Who is the one that hit you? Do you remember? They were all beating him. And then to dare to sit there and, well, who hit us, Christ? If you're the Messiah, then you know the one that, that just hit you. Who was it? Mocking him. And as it was being mocked and sentenced to crucifixion by Pilate, Jesus again was beaten, spit upon, and mocked, this time by the Roman soldiers. Friends, we know that verbal insults will come with standing for Christ and standing with Him, so physically and verbally. And then one that really hurts probably as much as any is those false accusations that come. You know, false accusations usually come when it's too late for you to defend yourself, aren't they? They're the ones that are hidden in the back rooms, the gossip, the ones that people go and say things about you without you finding out too much later before it's too late, before already everybody's got an opinion about who you are. Then it's done behind closed doors. And this is what we see here in this text. And falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. We stand for Christ. People are going to call you names behind your back. And this could be anybody from church members to being family members to being some of your closest friends. That they're not going to understand who you are in Christ. That who you are with Jesus as you stand for him, people will come and, and talk bad about you. Jesus' critics said of him in Matthew 11 and 9, Behold a gluttonous man. They're talking about Jesus here. Behold a gluttonous man and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Think about that. That's what they called Jesus. Jesus was sinless. Not one time was he drunk. Not one time did he partake in what the sinning people were doing. He stood above that and beyond that. And we need to understand that. And yet here's people saying this is who he is, casting uh, illusions about him that were not true whatsoever. So think about this, if the world said of the sinless Christ, what things can be said about us? What things can we be accused of? Slander behind our backs is harder to take because it's harder to defend than direct accusation. There's an ability to be spread and believe before we have a chance to correct it harms to reputation can be done even before we, have a, we are aware that someone has slandered us. But we can't help regretting, cannot help regretting slander, but we should not grieve about it. We should count it ourselves as blessed. When someone makes false accusations about you for standing for God, standing for Christ, standing for righteousness, smile. Well done, good and faithful servant. Way to stand on the rock. Way to not give in to the world's temptations or the things of the world. Way to stand firm in the midst of a world that's contrary to what the Bible says. It's good stuff to be able to, to take that badge on 
say whatever you may about me, but I'm going to stand with Christ. And I'm going to stand with Him. And I'm going to live a life of righteousness. The Lord assures us that when we, uh, when we are slandered, it's on account of Him, not because of who you are. You see, we really need to get us and ourselves out of the picture and remember when we stand for Christ it is him who they hate and you identify with Christ they're going to hate you as well but it is then it is him Jesus that they attack they're the one that's trying to slander his name his cause his purpose his mission the central theme of the beatitudes is righteousness to become righteous people before God. The first two have to do with recognizing our own unrighteousness. The next five have to do with our seeking and reflecting the righteousness of God. And this last beatitude has to do with our suffering for the sake of righteousness. And this same truth is expressed in the second part of the beatitude on account of me. Jesus is not speaking of every hardship, problem, or conflict believers may face, but those that the world brings on us because of our faithfulness to the Lord. 1 Peter 3, 13 through 18 says, And who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. You know, I think some people feel like they can't give an account of the hope is in you. Look, you may not be a biblical scholar, a theologian, but what you can say is I've got hope because of what Christ did on the cross for me and the resurrection and through that I know that if I were to die today I'd be in his presence that's my hope that's all you got to say no matter what questions they throw at you no matter how hard they could try to go at you theologically go back to the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ and you got it because that is our hope that's our blessed hope so this is what we need to see here this is what Peter's getting to and he says, and keep a good conscience so that the thing in which you are slandered, look, he already says you're going to be slandered. Isn't that funny? And keep a good conscience because so the thing that in which you are slandered, that of standing for Christ, those who revile you, your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so that you should suffer doing what is right uh, rather than what, for doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for sins once and for all the just and the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but be a man alive in the spirit. What a promise we have. What a hope we have in Jesus Christ. And so with this hope, it should bring some rejoicing and some gladness. And that's what we need to understand because the Bible here tells us that, uh, that as we stand and are falsely accused of every evil against you because of me, verse 12, be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. Isn't that great today that we can stand in persecution and be glad and, and rejoice? That word, be glad, means to exult, to rejoice greatly, to be overjoyed. The King James Version says, be exceedingly glad. The literal meaning is to skip and jump with happy excitement. Y'all that glad? Now think about it. This is glad and persecution. But that's literally what he's saying there. To, to skip and jump with joy, with happiness in your heart. You may, how many of y'all went to 4-H camp? You may, raise your hand up. I went to 4-H camp. You didn't go to 4-H camp? Oh, is that that? How many went to 4-H camp? 4-H camp. How many got the Sally down the alley? You know what I'm talking about? You missed the greatest blessing of your childhood. Because there's a cute little girl over there, and you skip along, and you're happy, and she takes your arm as you walk into that circle. 
Woo, talk about jumping. If you got that girl that week, and you're a little boy at 10 years old, 11 years old, I'm going to tell you, Michael Jordan had no hops like I had. <laughs> when the right girl, Sylvia, took my arm. That's the excitement. I can remember that like yesterday, man. You know, and then we had to go down to Vespers and pray about what we were thinking. But this is what we, this is what it's like. The joy, the smiles on your face to see you thinking about something that, that happy. That's what God wants from us, even through its persecuting ways, is that, is that through this we can be glad. Not to be glad when we suffer. Don't hear me wrong, that's kind of sadistic. That's not what we're talking about because we have people all around the world that, you know, during Easter do very sadistic things to try to mimic Christ. You know, nailing themselves to the cross, for, for example. That's all. No, that's awful doesn't show anything. It doesn't do anything. People, it's not about the suffering, but it's suffering for Christ's sake. It's suffering when we know we've made a stand for Jesus Christ and his righteousness and all that he gives us. That's what we, that's why we're glad. Is that God looks at us and, or we look at God and we say, we are counted worthy to be suffering like you suffered for me on the cross. We kind of worthy that we're being able to suffer just like the apostles before me. I kind of worthy to be able to, to stand today and, and, and take on this persecution, not because it's fun, not because it's great. Oh, look at me, I'm, I'm a martyr. No, it was more for, look, Jesus, I am faithful, and I want to be faithful until death. And then I'll receive my crown of righteousness. And that's what he's talking about being faithful to the end, being faithful on this earth. Look, the world can take away a great deal from God's people, but it cannot take away your joy or your happiness. Never. We know that nothing the world can do is, is permanent. It's not permanent. Although it seems permanent, it's not permanent. When people attack us for Christ's sake, they're attacking him, and their attacks can do no more permanent damage than they can to him. And what can they do to Jesus? Nothing. And what can they do to us in reality? Nothing. Because we're suffering his, or for his sake. And he says the Bible, now in the Bible he says our reward will be great. I'm going to tell you, life is a vapor. Is it not? Is it not a vapor? I mean, think about you that are parents and have adult children now. Was it a vapor? How quick they grew? Think about our own lives and, and how quickly we've gone from spry, and vibrant, and vigorous to gray hair and broken down knees and disease. It shouldn't be that way. But it is. It happens. The Bible tells us that. James 4, 14, a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. We may live to be 100 years old, but in the scheme of eternity, it's a, not even a blip on a screen. But heaven is forever. And heaven awaits us. That's what the Bible tells us here. For great is our reward in heaven. In heaven, there'll be no more pain and no more sorrow and no more suffering. There'll be no more heartache, no more disappointment. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more cancers. There'll be no more diabetes or heart disease or anything like that. There'll be no more knee replacements needed. No hip replacements. It'll be perfect in that new glorified body which Christ gives us. So we think about persecution, it's just going to last a brief time. It may seem like eternity. I'm going to tell you these last few months that I've been living in my own mind and in my life with my own surgery and struggle with health things and with my mom and with the stress of the church and my lack of being here for you guys like I needed to be. Believe me, 
Satan's been beating me up more than you, anybody in this room can imagine. But I know that it's just for a brief time. That I may be taken out of this world, but I got heaven awaiting. He may dump more on me, but it's not nothing I can't handle because of him. It's because of him. It's because of him that I can stand here today. It's because of what he did in my life as a 12-year-old boy in Warsaw, Kentucky, that I could stand and just not preach, but tell you about the goodness of God through these 58 years since I've been a Christian. Not 58 years, 48 years as a Christian. Don't want to age myself too quick. But I want you to know today that persecution may come in different forms physically, probably most likely not. Verbal, yes. False accusations, yes. I'll throw one in there, even mentally, how Satan works. How he can tear us down or try to tear us down. But through all these things that I've went through, through the surgery, over times, I really wondered. Through my mom's stuff, I was, times I even wondered what God was doing. But one thing that I could always go when I opened the Word of God, which I did every day for long periods of time, it gave me a sense of joy to know that my Savior lives and was with me. I want you to know that. That Jesus is real. No matter what we're walking through, no matter how painful it is right now, no matter how bleak the outcome may look. You being a believer in Jesus Christ on the other side is light and laughter and joy and gladness. So even in this time, you can walk through it. You can walk through it. This is what God does. So through persecution, God brings gladness and rejoicing. And he says in verse 10, don't miss this, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Once again, it's for you. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And that is so awesome to know that we have the kingdom of heaven now and to come, that God does restore. You remember Joseph? Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, was imprisoned. But what did God do? He raised him up to be the prime minister of Egypt and used him to save his chosen people from starvation and extinction. Remember Daniel? Daniel was thrown into a lion's den. And because of his refusal to stop worshiping the Lord, not only was life spared, but he was restored to a high position as the most valued commissioner of the king Darius. And the king made the declaration. This is what he said in Daniel 6, 26. And all dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. Notice that. It's not Daniel. It's the God of Daniel. For he is the living God enduring forever. Friends, today, it is our God in which this world trembles. Our God. Sylvia's God. Bonnie's God. Carmen's God. It is the God that they tremble and fear because he's living and will endure forever and ever and ever. So this morning, Persecution may come, but our God endures. This morning, do you have that relationship with this enduring God? If not, I'd love to share with you what the Scripture says, how to have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. I would love to share with you not my opinion of what I think, but what I know, what the Bible says and teaches us and tells us about coming to a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you would like to have that discussion with me at this time, you come forward. And you 
take me by the hand and say, Brother Jeff, I want to know more. And we'll, we, will, we will work together to find out and to see and discover the goodness of God. Some of you this morning may want to come because you know that you may have gotten a little frustrated, a little disappointed in your own life with the persecution that you, it seems like to be coming on you, but today you've been given this new hope. And so today you just want to come and repent and say, God, I'm no longer allow the things of this world, the pressures of this world, the, the way that I think the world is. I'm going to just trust you more and more like I did when I first believed. You come, pray. Maybe you want to come be part of our church and join, unite with us. Help us win this community to Jesus Christ. Help us win Bardstown, Nelson County, state of Kentucky, the world to Jesus Christ. Maybe you come. I'm going to give you a little good report. Right now we have a person that we worked with and they ministered here for a short time. I'm not going to give a name out because of, you can ask me afterwards, but because of security reasons, I'm not going to say a lot. But we have a young girl that's ministering overseas right now through the International Mission Board that worked with our youth here in Bardstown, Kentucky. She heard that call and she went. And now she's faithfully serving. That awesome? Come from your church. You had a part in our life. So this is the stuff that we do. We surrender these things and God may take us and do things with us that we never imagined before in our lives. So this morning, what's God calling you to do? How's God calling you to respond? The one thing the Bible clearly states over and over, Jesus always offers this, come. Come to me. Come to Christ. I'll give you rest. Carmen, you come. I'm going to pray. And you lead us in our hymn of invitation. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this day, and we thank you that we can learn a little bit more about being persecuted, Lord, and knowing that it can't steal our joy or our happiness, Lord. And that, God, you are always there with us, and that, God, you have sealed us, pardoned us, forgave us, loved us, been gracious to us. God, let us never, ever, ever forget that. We love you so much, Jesus. And it is in your name I pray. Amen. And we sing hymn number 414. If you please stand. Well, stand. You come. You come as God leads.
God bless you all, man. It's been a good day to be in God's house. Thank you, Carmen. Appreciate you so much. Thank you uh, for standing in, helping. Uh, but we are glad that you're here today, and we pray that you'll have a good day as you leave here. You are dismissed. God bless you all, and go in peace. Thank you.